Conspiracy Parties. Nigel Farage of UKIP, Caroline Lucas from the Greens, and respects Mr Galloway. It proved to be a remarkable discussion about one of the most fundamental but also least discussed problems of Westminster. First, however, I asked the YouGov pollster Peter Kellner to put the subject into its context and describe how our political parties have evolved since World War II. In my lifetime, there have been two big changes. The first is, you go back to when I was a growing up in the 1950s, somewhere like 97, 98% of all voters in general elections voted Labour or Conservative. And a great many of them felt very strongly there was a strong partisanship on one side or the other. British politics was very much a two-party system. There were two things that have happened since then. Uh, firstly, that in more recent general elections, the number of people voting for other parties has gone up very sharply. The Liberal Democrats we know about, the Nationalists in Scotland and Wales. And then in some seats, like Caroline Lucas winning Brighton for the Greens, George Galloway in Bethlehem Green and Bow, and then uh, more recently in Bradford winning seats, we had Martin Bell, we had the Doctor, Dr. Taylor in, in, in Kidderminster. Though apart from those small exceptions, parties have not made big breakthroughs. There is not a big Green contingent at Westminster as there is, for example, in Germany, even though levels of support are probably fairly similar for the two parties. But the second thing that's happened is that we have now quite a few proportional elections in Scotland, in Wales, in London, for the European Parliament. And in those cases, the traditionally smaller parties, such as the Greens, such as the UK Independence Party, are able to win seats, and therefore they tend to attract more votes from people who at a general election would regard a Green vote or a UK vote as a wasted vote. And the people we've got uh, in the studio now, UKIP, Greens and Respect, what percentage of the population do they represent now? Well, it depends on the election you ask about. I mean, UKIP actually, in the last two, two or three weeks, uh, been up around 8 or 9% in our YouGov polls, and they're uh, pretty well level pegging at the moment with the Liberal Democrats. Together, you're looking at the minor party total of about 16, 17%. But if you ask at the time of a proportional election, like the European election, that vote goes through the roof. So it depends on which election you're asking about. So something amazing has happened. The percentage of the population voting for the two major parties since the end of World War II has halved from about 98% to about 49%. George Galloway, why has that happened? Well, I think the half inch of space between them all is one of the factors. People see no real difference between what I've described as three cheeks of the same backside, and they don't particularly like the look of the backside, and they want to give it a kicking. And Peter Kellner is right that at elections where a candidate can credibly defeat them, they will go for that candidate, but when not, they will simply stay away from the polls, which is one of the explanations for the historically low level of turnout, surely, in British general elections. But where a real contest takes place, like Caroline's, for example, in Brighton, where a credible candidate against the mainstream emerges, uh, they're ready to vote for her, and I don't think any of them are sorry about it. Caroline. I think George is right that in many respects the kind of cosy consensus at, at Westminster doesn't reflect where most people actually would like to put their votes. If you look at issues like withdrawal from Afghanistan, the majority of people would like our troops withdrawn from Afghanistan as soon as possible. None of the main three parties in Westminster are calling for that. If you look at things like the privatisation of public services, you know, people didn't want this horrendous privatisation of, of the NHS that's been driven through Westminster. Most people don't want that, but they don't find that position being reflected and so I think people are desperately looking for parties that can reflect what they really want and you know the European elections in 2009 over a million people voted green I think there is a huge upswelling of people that would love to vote for alternatives and when they're given the opportunity of knowing that that vote has a really good chance of translating into seats they will do it. So Nigel Farage do you agree with that? There's a crisis of some kind in the traditional party system. Yeah, I mean, I looked at it and we're run by a bunch of college kids. And none of them have ever had a job, never worked in the real world. They look the same, they sound the same, they're virtually interchangeable. Uh, they agree on all the big issues, whether it's, you know, Europe or immigration or green taxes. I mean, the differences between them are so small, you frankly can't put a cigarette paper between them. And so what's happening? is you've got different parties with different philosophies that are beginning to pick up support. And I must say, I think Peter Kellner, uh, when he talks about others, 
always, always downplays UKIP. I mean, let's just get it straight. UKIP came second across the entire United Kingdom in the European elections. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised at what's going on. And after all, in Northern Ireland and in Scotland, politics has changed radically in the last 20 years. I think it's now England's turn. Peter Kellner, the UKIP mm. charges, basically, mm. that they are ignored by BBC in mm. particular, whereas the Greens are emphasised by the, the mainstream media. And, and UKIP is... Well, I have to say, I mean, I'm not going to speak for the BBC, I haven't done a, a, a time count, but in looking at the, across the media in general, I think the principal UKIP cause, which is criticism of and support for withdrawal from the European Union, gets a huge amount of play. I don't think the UKIP cause, which may be separate from the UKIP institution, I don't think the UKIP cause is underplayed in the media in the least. Nigel well, the, the way that the London elections that are going on at the moment and the mayoral election that's going on, you know, the BBC push the Greens, the Greens, the Greens, the Greens, they are the fourth party, UKIP doesn't exist, and Peter Kellner himself, of course, who runs YouGov, Despite the fact that UKIP have now been above the Lib Dems in some polls, when Peter Kellner asks his people how do they intend to vote if there's a general election tomorrow, it's Labour, Lib Dem, Conservative and others. I'm, I'm sure... That's, it, that's I'm enough. I'm sure that's that enough. That Caroline Lucas, what do you say to this allegation that Nigel Farage is saying you're sort of bigged up by the um, respectable press? Well, it's not something we've noticed for sure. I mean, I think it's quite, you know, telling that it, in a sense the smaller parties are now fighting amongst ourselves for some crumbs from the table of, of national media where what we should be doing is saying actually let's make sure that all of us get a bigger say when it comes to a national media that is so focused on the main parties so focused on what's happening only at Westminster. In parallel with the collapse of the big parties is the collapse of the credibility of the big media. Nobody covered my by-election. I mean nobody except a woman from the Guardian three days before the poll. Our media was social media, was Twitter, was text, was Facebook, uh, was YouTube, and that's more and more a feature. I can, at the touch of a button, speak to hundreds of thousands of people via Twitter and Facebook. I have 150,000 followers on both. So I actually don't need the mainstream media, and our election campaign was built entirely outside of the Westminster bubble. Caroline Lucas, you're very effective in articulating issues that don't get onto the media, which aren't reflected by the main parties, maybe. But the fact is, at the end of the day, you are just protest parties, aren't you? You're, when it comes to a general election, it's going to be Labour or Conservative or a mixture of the main three. Well, look what's happening in those countries that have a proportional election system. You've had Greens in government in many, many European countries, as well as in parliaments, of course. And I think we need two things. First of all, a properly proportional system so that people's views can be represented in the political system. But also state funding for political parties, because, you know, the smaller parties are literally having to, or certainly speaking for the Greens, you know, we're funded entirely by our members. That means that we're running campaigns literally on tens of thousands of pounds at most. We need a much fairer way of enabling everybody to be able to vote for what they believe in. Right now, we don't have that possibility in this country. George Galloway. We need both those things, but we're not going to get either. Uh, no one has an appetite in Britain for the taxpayer giving money to political parties. Neither are we going to get, especially after the way the Lib Dems disastrously handled their card over proportional representation, uh, leading the alternative vote referendum to a ruinous disaster. Uh, we're not going to get either of these things. So we will either have business as usual with uh, continuing seeping away of the credibility of the political class, of the mainstream political class, or we'll get a breakthrough. Now, I think, the bookies think, I'll hold on to the seat I won with a 10,000 majority last time. That would be a first, I think. Peter will tell me if I'm wrong. Certainly a first for a left-wing party. And we're just going to have to, inch by inch, build our way forward in this and I think that we can because all over the north and post-industrial Britain throughout the country there's a sense that uh, an agenda of austerity and war is making poor people pay for the crimes and the failings of rich and powerful people who've mishandled the way we're run. Nigel Farage, is there something which can change the small parties which have such amazing successes in particular places into a mainstream national political force? 
I believe it can happen. As I said earlier, we've seen the SNP go from nothing to being the biggest party in Scotland. We've seen Dr Paisley's party go from the back streets to being the biggest party in Northern Ireland. So it's happened across the United Kingdom, and I think it can happen in England, but the key is this. Are people just going to vote for the three parties we're talking about today as a protest, or are they going to begin to see voting for different parties as voting for radical policy solutions? And if we start to get particularly younger people in big numbers saying, hey, the old guard offer me nothing. Here's a party that really represents what I would love to see a British government doing. That, I think, is the key. It is turning that negative vote to begin with into a positive vote. And if that happens, the landscape will change very quickly indeed. Can I just say, Peter, I think the, the, the precedent of Scotland and Northern Ireland that Nigel Farage praise and aid, I don't think works, because essentially these are single-issue insurgents uh, for independence in Scotland and a particular form of sectarian politics, uh, which we all recall from Northern Ireland. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, there should be a breakthrough. I am saying that as long as we keep the Westminster, the first past the post system of Westminster, I think George Galloway is right and we will for the foreseeable future, you need something like a national nervous breakdown to break the two-party um, duopoly. So the real question is, are we predicting such a big national nervous breakdown? I don't see it. But the, I'm sure you think the point is this, that I think the people that are turning to UKIP are not just turning to UKIP on Europe, they're seeing the fact that the party has a broad range of policies, we're not single issue obsessives, we're offering a real political alternative. But for Nigel, I, I'm not willing to bet against George Galloway keeping his seat. I'm willing to bet with you, Nigel, that UKIP will still have no MPs after the next general election. Well, you know, we've got European elections coming up, we've got a whole range of of district and county council elections coming up, and I think big change is coming. So, and you'd accept that, uh, Nigel Farage? Nigel, a tenor. A tenor? Well, I'm happy to have Pounds a tenor. Pounds, not euros. But, um, but, right, ten pounds, but, ten pounds, but, pounds, but I'm, also, I'm also quite keen to have a bet with Peter on the outcome of the next European election, if you'd like <laughs> to do that. Now, I Caroline would, Lucas. I, I want to go back to your prediction of whether or not we're going to have a, a national nervous breakdown. I wouldn't rule that out, quite honestly. I think the level of disillusionment and frustration with politics today is enormous. I think the upswelling of organisations or, or movements like the Occupy movement, UK Uncut, are actually capturing popular imagination in a way that the mainstream political parties simply aren't. I think the level of anger that we're going to see about the cuts is only just beginning. Remember, only around 10% of the cuts have actually happened yet. We've got huge, more austerity and vicious attacks on some of the poorest people in our society still coming down the tracks at us. We've got an environmental crisis, so I wouldn't rule out some kind of serious breakdown, and the point is that when that happens, Smaller political bodies need to be there, I think, like the Greens, to put forward a positive way out of that, rather than the way that perhaps a party like the BNP might try to do it. And with Dr Lucas on this one, I predict a collective uh, national nervous breakdown. I think that the level of discontent touches upon hatred, and I discovered that everywhere I went in Bradford, a hatred of the mainstream leaders. People think that they are of no use at all, and don't talk to them and don't represent them. And if that feeling is replicated in many parts of the country, then there will be this collective political nervous breakdown and the system could crack open. And I date it back to the crisis over the Iraq war, which was followed by the expenses scandal and which has been followed now by this ironclad consensus across the three front benches over austerity and cuts, making poor people pay for the crimes and errors of rich people. This critical mass, I believe, is developing. And if you know what happens when you get a critical mass, you get a very, very big explosion. George Galloway, Nigel Farage and Caroline Lucas, all in discussion with Peter Kellner. And that talk of a national nervous break...